In the book of Revelation, the apostle John, being caught up into heaven, beheld this scene. In chapter 5, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seal? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look on it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest and to our God and they will reign upon the earth. He is worthy. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Slave from every people and tribe, 
Every nation and tongues. He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy of this? He He did. He taught 
as though he believed it. He taught it with the credibility and credulity that scripture has in and of itself because it is the very word of God. So he began to tell them parables. He told of two sons and the father asking the first one to go out into the field. He said no, but later repented himself and he went out and he worked in the vineyard. And the second he came to him and he said, sure, dad, but he didn't go. And they asked the question, so who did the will of the father? And they were quick to answer, well, the second. And so his response to that, verse 32, is he said, John came to you in the way of righteousness, but you would not believe him. But the tax collectors and the harlots, they believed him. And you seeing, neither did you repent, nor did you believe him. And so we find that he's looking and he's making these parables. He's addressing the parables to them. He talks about a vineyard. And he talks about the man who is the vine dresser, and he plants a vineyard, and he builds a wall around the vineyard, and he puts up um, he puts up a, a tower in the vineyard. Then he rents it out to ten of farmers, and when he comes in order that he can get the fruit of the of the vines, when he comes, he sends his servants. In fact, he uses plural, and he sends, and it says that the vine dressers of verse thirty five, they took his servants and they beat them, they killed some, and they stoned others. And again, he sent more um, servants to them than the first. And they did the same thing likewise to them. And then later he sent to them his son. And he was saying that they will be ashamed when they see my son. But the binder, or the, the tenant farmer seeing the son said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and we will have his inheritance. And so taking him, they cast him outside of the vineyard and they killed him. Now when the Lord of that vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenant farmers? And they said to him, well, he will do severely to them, killing them, and he will then give the vineyard to other tenant farmers, such as will give to him the fruit in his time. Jesus isn't talking about, about growing grapes. He's not talking about a vineyard. But he's talking about Israel as the vineyard. And we find that in Isaiah chapter 5. He's looking at this vineyard and looking at producing fruit. And those tenant farmers are the priests. They're the rulers and the leaders of the people of Israel. And they did not bring the fruit that was worthy. I think of Ezekiel when he talks about the shepherds. And that they are eating the fat of the lambs. And that they are tromping in the water so that they are mudding it. So that there's neither grass to eat nor water uh, to drink for the people. And that the the, the Shepherds um, are abusing the people. He's looking at the leaders, at the, at the prophets of Israel, at the priests of Israel, at the kings of Israel, and how they have disregarded. But he sends his son, and Jesus foretells on that day, on that Monday, foretells that they are going to kill him. God sent his son, and they will kill him. They will reject him, and they will think to themselves, now we will have his inheritance. What belongs rightfully to him will then become ours. And that's what they say. Supposed, But rather Jesus asked them, and they answer rightly in verse 41, that when the Lord comes, and on that day, he will utterly destroy them, and he will give it to others. Just as John's preaching went to the priest and to the rulers, and they rejected him, and it did return to the, to the tax collectors, to the harlots, and they believed and entered into the kingdom of God because they repented and believed. But these continue to refuse to believe. And so he comes in verse 42 and he quotes from Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected, this has become the chief cornerstone. And it, is, it has come about from the Lord. And this is marvelous in our sight. So Jesus looks and he announces that here is exactly what was going to happen. Peter refers to this passage as well in 1 Peter in chapter 2. Where he talks about that the stone, those who fall upon it would be crushed and that those who would fall on it then would be humbled. So that there would be two responses to the stone. That when the building of God, the house of God would be built upon with living stones. He said there's a stone and the builders have rejected it. Here's Christ who has come, the rock that, that followed Israel all through their wilderness wanderings. As Deuteronomy 32 reminds them in that wonderful song of Moses about the rock that followed them, the rock that provided for them. And so God has provided this rock, this stone, but the people have rejected it. 
and yet is the very foundation upon which God's work, what God was doing, would be established. And Jesus is telling them, in their hearing and in their ears, he's telling them. And they hear it and they understand it. It's one thing to hear and not have a clue. But it's another to hear it and know exactly what's being said because it's not confusing. And to hear exactly what is said and to hear the consequences of refusing to believe it and then to respond, not just in unbelief, but in an anti-belief, against all belief. Today we have not only atheists, but we have anti-theists. Not just those who don't believe in a God at all, but those who are so opposed to God that they're bitterly angry at any concept of God. And it, to me, in my mind, is very similar to what we have with the chief priest and the Pharisees in verse 45. Because when they heard this parable, they knew that he was talking about them. There was no confusion in their mind. They understood. And so their response was, as they sought to seize him, but they're afraid of the crowd because they held him to be a prophet. This passage on this day, it begins that the people see Jesus as, the, as not just a prophet, but the prophet, the one who has come from Nazareth. And he sees the response of the chief priest and the Pharisees, and they see him just as one among many prophets who have come, that the people hold him to be a prophet in the line of the prophet, but nothing special, not unique, not the one that Moses had announced because they really didn't look for him or expect him to come in any way at all. So the question comes to us this, this Monday as we look at the confrontation that went on and we see the confrontation, the first challenging authority, does Christ have the right? Does Christ have the right to ask of us or even to demand of us faith and obedience and repentance? Does he have the right? And the answer is yes, because he is the prophet who has come from God. He has come by God's bidding. He has come and he has entered into the world to be the Emmanuel, the God with us. He has come to do the will of the Father, not the will of his own, but to do the will of the Father. And as he has come to do the will of the Father, he comes on the authority of the Father. And he comes on the authority of his own character, of his own nature, that he is God who became a man and that he would die for our sins and rise for our justification. He comes with authority, and yet they refused to receive this authority. He gave to them from their history a parable that would talk about obedience and disobedience. And here they are, sons before God, and given position, given authority, themselves to have authority. And yet they use their authority in ways that were not pleasing to God. In fact, it would be as though they were thieves, those who were taking that which did not belong to them. The people of Israel did not belong to the chief priests and to the Pharisees and to the leaders. They belong to God. They're God's flock, and they are but hirelings who have come to, to rule over God's people and to lead God's people to sheep. And so it would be even so that refusing to hear the prophets that God said that there would be nothing left for them but unbelief and ultimately destruction. For as they desired to destroy Jesus and to have him killed, they themselves would be destroyed in their own sin. They heard, they did not believe. And hearing without faith saves no one. God calls upon each and every one to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. To come to the stone that God has chosen to be the chief cornerstone. It is from the Lord. And he has come from the Lord. And that we marvel at, at Jesus Christ and we see him in that wonder and that splendor. So what should our response be? Well, there are those who are going to fall because of him and stumble because of him. And there are the others that will fall down before him. So which will it be? Those who stumble and fall because of him will be crushed. Those who fall and those who come humbly before him will be saved. So what would your response be? And it's my prayer that today you receive the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, that you come in repentance of your sin and that you turn to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he was looking for from the, the chief priests and the Pharisees. It's what he was looking for the crowd. And that's what he's looking for from us. And so we close this evening. And I hope that you will consider these passages in Matthew chapter 21. And as you read through it, to think of your own place in this event. Lord.
Lord God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our God. We thank you, God, for your mercy and for your grace.